Great. Thank you very much, and thanks for that very kind introduction. Clearly, they couldn't get me out of school fast enough. Um, so I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit today about uh, where we are in the field, because things uh, there's a lot going on in the news. There's a lot going on in research for Alzheimer's disease. And I wanted to catch you all up with what's uh, really fun and exciting in the field right now and what hope we have for the future. Um, so, as you can tell, I wear a lot of hats. One of the hats I wear is that I am a neurologist and I do see patients uh, in a memory clinic at Stanford. And so recently I saw this 68-year-old gentleman who came to our clinic not so much because he wanted to be there but because his wife wanted him to come because she was worried about him. So. For the last couple of years, you know, he's been maybe asking the same question more than once. If she gives him, th you know, she leaves in the morning and she gives him three things to do that day. You know, all I need you to do is three things. And he does one of them. Now, I mean, she wrote that off as being normal husband stuff uh, for a while. But, um, you know, it, it, start it became more and more repetitive. There was one event that really um, sort of... Uh, stood out to her as proof that this was something different. Um, so uh, they got an invitation in the mail one day. Um, their, uh, their niece uh, down in, so, so they live up in San Francisco. So their niece down in LA uh, was gonna get married. Uh, this is uh, the wife's sister's daughter. And they were very close with this family and, you know, very excited to hear that this niece was going to get married. And they talked about, so how are we going to get down to Los Angeles? Well, you know, we've never been down Highway 1. That's a beautiful drive. It's a little bit of a commitment. It's a long way uh, from San Francisco to L.A. along Highway 1, right along the Pacific Coast. So they talked a little bit about how they would plan for uh, taking that trip. You know, how many hours it would take, you know, whether it would work and so on. So they spent a few minutes talking about that. And they sort of made some decisions, and then the wife was wrapping up the conversation saying, great, I'll let my sister know that we can attend the wedding. And he said, what wedding? <laughs> now, they had just talked about it. Maybe, you know, five minutes had passed, or ten minutes at most, while they were talking about this trip down Highway 1. But in that period of time, he had no idea who was getting married. So he still drives, he still sits on a couple of boards, he's retired from his job, he's still doing everything in his life that he wants to do, he's independent. And so um, the, first, uh, the first question is audience participation, so you tell me, what should I as a doctor tell this guy? Should I tell him, you know, you're just like the rest of us, you better get used to getting old. Does anybody like that answer? Okay, nobody likes that. What about this one? He might have a problem, but why bother doing anything about it? Anyway, there's nothing you can really do. Okay, you would be surprised how many primary care doctors out there have this opinion. And you saw this statistic that, uh, that you know, maybe even less than half of patients with Alzheimer's disease are even told by their physicians that they have Alzheimer's disease. And that's one of the driving forces. Physicians don't feel empowered to do anything about it, and they why should I tell a patient that I'm worried about them when I can't really help them? Okay, so we don't like that answer. What about this one? Let's get the Alzheimer's disease test and get on therapy as soon as possible so that we can prevent this from getting worse. Okay, I like this answer. The problem is we're not there yet. Um, I think D is the right answer, and D represents what the current reality is. There are some tests that are available for patients like this gentleman. There are pros and cons to these tests. And there is some value in telling people what we think is going on with them, even if there's not a cure available. So I want to spend the next 35 minutes or so going into more detail about, um, about this current state of the art and where we're headed. So. Just taking, you know, let's continue with this gentleman. So he's, he's coming to me, he's got this problem. We're all worried about him, so I share your worry. So what can I do for him? Well, I can order some neuropsychological tests. I can send him to a colleague of mine who can administer some uh, very difficult, challenging tests of memory, language function, visual spatial function, etc. Not sure what's going on with my slides. Well, while we're figuring that out, I can just talk. So um, 
what these tests do is, um, uh, these tests are hard, nobody gets 100% on them, and the goal is to, uh, to see if he is scoring outside of the normal range for people of his same age and same level of education. We'll see if it comes back up. And then in addition, um, everybody who comes to see the doctor uh, with, a, with a new memory problem ought to have some blood work done because there are, by, one thing I'm going to emphasize is that Alzheimer's disease isn't the only thing that can cause memory problems. Um, if you have a hormone deficiency or a vitamin deficiency, you know, you want your doctor to figure that out because that's easy to fix. So there's some simple blood work that everybody ought to get. And then in addition, everybody, anybody over the age of 50 who's got a new problem with their memory ought to have a picture taken of their brain. Um, it's rare, but I have had cases of patients who come to my clinic with complaints just like this gentleman who, you know, surprise me and have a tumor or something else like that. A stroke can be the cause of a memory problem sometimes. Um, and so uh, it's important to get a picture taken of the brain because you might end up making a diagnosis that takes you down a different pathway. Okay, so this is a summary of the things that I would want to do with this gentleman. And part of this is to emphasize that it is worth going to see a doctor if you have a problem with your memory because there are things that the doctor can do. And in fact, there might be other diseases that are discovered and that can be cured. Um, and that's worthwhile. So this gentleman, his test results, so we, we did neuropsychological testing. And in fact, when we gave him a list of words to memorize or a story to remember, and then we distracted him for 20 minutes and came back later and said, what was that list of words that we practiced together? He had no idea. He maybe got one of them or something like that. But on other tests, he did really well. His language function was good. We gave him really difficult visual puzzles to work out, and he did just fine with that. Executive function, which is where the tester pulls out a stopwatch and times him on doing a whole bunch of different puzzles, he did great on all that stuff. His only problem was that his memory wasn't so good. He, he could remember something for a second, but then if you distracted him, it was gone. All right, so his blood work was normal and his brain scan was normal. He, was, he did not have a stroke and he didn't have a brain tumor. And so the next audience participation question is, now what should I tell him as his doctor based on this testing? Should I tell him he's fine? Well, he wasn't fine, right? His, his memory was, was abnormal. Should I tell him he has dementia? Okay. We're not so sure about that. Unfortunately, he's in this kind of gray area. And unfortunately, most of my profession is in a sort of gray area where we're dealing with patients like this all the time who aren't clearly demented but aren't normal. And I think this is one of the big challenges that doctors and scientists have is what do we tell patients like this and what can we do for them? So I wanted to make sure that everybody understands this scheme, all right? There is something out there called normal aging. I'm not quite sure what it is. The longer I'm in this profession, the less I know about what normal aging is. I mean, it's certainly the case that as we get older, you know, I, I can tell you all about that movie I saw two weeks ago, but you know, what was the name of that actor? That gets worse and worse with age, and we, we know that, and we don't think that that's tied to a specific illness. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is this thing called dementia. Now, dementia has a definition. Dementia means that somebody has had a decline in their level of thinking, so they used to be smarter, and now their cognitive skills have declined, and it's reached a threshold where you now need help with day-to-day -day activities. This could be something as simple as balancing a checkbook or being able to manage a household or you know, drive to your hairdresser's appointment. It doesn't mean necessarily that you can't eat and toilet and you know, uh, take care of your personal hygiene. It just means that you now need help with day-to-day -day activities. You're not fully independent. That's what dementia means. We have this in-between category now called mild cognitive impairment, which refers to patients just like this gentleman I told you about, whose cognition is not normal. It has declined 
from a previously normal level, but he has not reached a threshold where he needs help with day-to-day -day activities. One question that I get a lot from my patients is what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Um, the news media doesn't, take, doesn't answer this question very well either, and they get it mixed up. These terms refer to two totally different things, okay? Dementia refers to how severe somebody's cognitive problem is. In other words, dementia is a statement of severity, all right? Mild cognitive impairment is also a statement of severity. So these are just categories of how severe somebody's cognitive impairment is, okay? By contrast, Alzheimer's disease is an example of a cause of cognitive dysfunction. People who are aging normally can have Alzheimer's disease and not know it yet. People with mild cognitive impairment can have Alzheimer's disease as the cause of their mild cognitive impairment. And people with dementia can have Alzheimer's disease as the cause of their problems. Um, one point I want to make is do not if a doctor tells you or a client of yours or a family member of yours, you have dementia, period. That's not the end of the sentence because dementia is not really a diagnosis. It's just a statement that somebody's had a decline in their cognition. You need to ask your doctor, well, what's the cause of the dementia? Is it Alzheimer's disease or something else? Okay. So why does Alzheimer's disease get so much attention? Well, it gets so much attention because it is by far and away the leading cause of dementia in older people around the world. It causes at least two-thirds of all cases of dementia. Um, the statistics you've heard a bit about already, the sixth leading cause of death, it's probably actually a high, it, it, it's, I bet it should actually rank higher on the list of causes of death. Alzheimer's disease does not get listed on the death certificate as often as it should. Um, Patients might die of pneumonia. Well, why did grandma get pneumonia? Grandma got pneumonia because she's in, been in bed for a year. Why has she been in bed for a year? Well, because she's demented. She has Alzheimer's disease and her family can't, you know, get her out and walk her anymore. Um, so Alzheimer's disease uh, kills a lot of people. Uh, probably well more than five million Americans have the disease. Two thirds of them are women. And it costs our country an incredible amount of money, as you heard Ruth tell you about. There are other causes of dementia. Strokes can cause dementia. Lewy body disease, which is a relative of Parkinson's disease, can cause dementia. Frontotemporal dementia, there are other rarer causes, infections like syphilis and HIV. There's a long list of things that doctors like me need to know about as being causes of dementia. And that's, again, the reason to go see a doctor is to make sure it's not one of these other things, some of which are treatable. The statistics are scary. At age 60, so if you take a room full of 60-year-olds, about 1% of them will have uh, the beginning symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. But there's this exponential rise that occurs after age 60, so that in the 85-plus population, that percentage is getting closer to 30 to 50%. So 30 to 50% of people over the age of 85 have both the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in life and at autopsy, actually a greater proportion of them have the physical findings of Alzheimer's disease at autopsy, suggesting that if people had lived longer, eventually, well, this is a question in the scientific field, would everybody get dementia if they, or get Alzheimer's disease if they lived long enough? Um, we're not sure if we know the answer to that, but certainly a majority of people do. What are the risk factors? Well, age by far and away is the leading risk factor. Can't do much about that. Genetics? Can't do much about that either. Family history is important. There's a particular gene called the ApoE gene that comes in three flavors, ApoE2, 3, and 4. I don't know why there's not a 1. There just isn't. Um, but if you inherit the 4 version of that gene, ApoE4, you have an increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease during your life. It doesn't cause the disease, and there are 90-year-olds who have the gene and don't have Alzheimer's disease, but it just raises your risk. Vascular risk factors, things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, having had a heart attack or a stroke, all of these things raise your risk factors for getting Alzheimer's disease one day. Diabetes. Uh, type 2 diabetes, the type that we as Americans are getting more and more of because 
you know, we're, we're eating more carbohydrates and uh, we're getting fatter and, you know, and all this, the so-called metabolic syndrome that you've heard uh, doctors and the news media talk about, there's a type association with type 2 diabetes and this metabolic syndrome and an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a modifiable risk factor. This is a risk factor that we can do something about. Prior head trauma, another thing that we can do something about, like make kids put on helmets uh, when they do sports. Low education level, that's something that we can do something about as a society as well. That raises the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. What are the symptoms? So by far and away in my clinic, the first symptom that people are usually aware of or their spouses or adult children are aware of is difficulty remembering recent things. No trouble with what happened 20 years ago, but what happened five minutes ago is hard for the person to remember, and that's often the first thing to go wrong. Um, other things can come up, word finding problems. You know, can you hand me that, um, that um, oh, you know, that thing over there. Um, but sometimes that problem gets worse and worse to the point that it's hard for somebody to communicate. Difficulty with navigation and also difficulty with visual perception when it's not a problem with your eyes. Sometimes that can be a, a, a symptom in Alzheimer's disease. Difficulty with organization and problem solving and withdrawal from usual activities. Sometimes, especially for people uh, living alone or with you know, other forms of social iso isolation, Sometimes people notice that with, you know, you know, Sally isn't showing up to Bridge Club anymore. Why isn't she showing up to Bridge Club anymore? Sometimes that's a sign that it's worth investigating a little bit because it could be that she's depressed. That's important um, to notice and to treat. But it could be that she forgot that it's Tuesday um, and, and isn't keeping track of her calendar anymore. In order to get my attention as a doctor, these symptoms need to get worse over time. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease gets worse from year to year. Patients, I, occasionally I have patients who come to me and say, hey doc, my memory's been crummy for 30 years. I say, well that's just you, that's not, that's not a disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease has to get, uh, the symptoms need to get worse in order to capture the attention of the doctor. I'm saying that to put at ease uh, all of you in the room who are saying, you can't think of words and you can't remember how to, uh, uh, you, know, you know, what happened five minutes ago. How does a doctor diagnose Alzheimer's disease? Well, in the old days, and to a large degree, we're still in the old days, a doctor like me will, you know, interview a patient, hear about the symptoms, and, you know, do the blood work that I talked about, do the brain imaging tests that I talk about, and when nothing else comes up, there's no other diagnosis that can be made, there's no other you know, problem that I can see, I figure, well, you know, the cause of this patient's memory problems must be the one thing I can't test for, and that's Alzheimer's disease. Um, in life, the, the, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is only suspected. Um, the definitive diagnosis comes at autopsy. I offer autopsy to all of my patients. I have very few takers. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why. The problem with this approach is that it is both insensitive and nonspecific. So insensitive means that um, there are people who walk into my office uh, who I tell, you know, I think you're fine. I think this sounds like normal aging to me. I'm, I'm not too worried about you. Who in fact, if I could magically do an autopsy that day, those people may actually have Alzheimer's disease and I might be giving them inaccurate information, okay? Um, this approach to diagnosis is also nonspecific. That means that there might be patients who walk into my office who I say, gosh, you know, I'm really worried about Alzheimer's disease in you. I'm worried that Alzheimer's disease is the cause of your memory problems. When in fact, if we could do an autopsy, we would find out it's something else like Lewy body disease or frontotemporal dementia. Um, so this isn't acceptable. We as a field need to do a better job. We need to be definitive in talking with patients about what disease they have. Um, because I think being able to be definitive with patients is both what the patients want and we need it as we start to develop therapies that eventually one day are going to uh, treat Alzheimer's disease but not necessarily treat the other illnesses that I mentioned.
And so the new days, I just told you that, you know, that approach to Alzheimer's disease as a diagnosis of exclusion is kind of the old days. The new days um, are such that we now have some tests that we can actually do in life to see if somebody has Alzheimer's disease pathology without waiting for an autopsy. Um, and to do this, we use what are called biomarkers. A biomarker is anything that you can easily measure, for instance, through a blood test or a brain imaging test, something that's easy to measure that stands in the place of something that's harder to measure, like what the brain looks like under the microscope. Um, a good example of a biomarker is your uh, cholesterol level. Who here has, at some point in their life, had their cholesterol level checked? Okay, most of us have. And your doctor checked it not because your doctor really cares about what your cholesterol level is. The LDL is the bad cholesterol. Cholesterol never killed anybody. Having too much of it or too little isn't a known medical problem. Rather, your cholesterol level is a biomarker of your risk for getting a heart attack or a stroke. Okay, does that make sense? Your, your doctor's checking your bad cholesterol level because he's trying to figure out what's your risk of getting a heart attack or a stroke one day, um, and then you know, giving you treatments that will help to prevent that. So here's what we're trying to uh, figure out using biomarkers. So this is what a brain looks like under the microscope. There are two findings that the neuropathologist has to see. There are plaques, these kind of smudges, spherical smudges of a protein called beta amyloid. And there's this other finding in the brain called tangles. And this is a collection of a different protein called the tau protein. So a neuropathologist has to see both plaques and tangles, both the beta amyloid protein and the tau protein, in a patient who has cognitive problems in order to make a diagnosis of definite Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so two things that that neuropathologist has to see. So what biomarkers do we now have at our disposal in the clinic? So one thing that I do in some patients is I do a spinal tap to get cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid is this watery substance that surrounds your brain and spinal cord. Unlike the blood, cerebral spinal fluid directly touches the brain and therefore uh, shares some of the same chemicals that the brain has. And uh, as I said, you can get this by performing a lumbar puncture, which sounds much worse than it is. It's an easy procedure that we do uh, in the clinic every day. Um, and you can measure directly the amount of amyloid in, uh, in the cerebral spinal fluid. It turns out that as amyloid is getting stuck in the brain tissue in Alzheimer's disease, it's not getting flushed out through the cerebral spinal fluid. And so the finding is that amyloid levels in the spinal fluid are too low in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So this is a test that's now available in the clinic. In addition, so I'm telling you about tests for amyloid. So measuring amyloid in the spinal fluid is one test that's available for amyloid. In addition, there's a new technology called amyloid PET imaging. This is a new kind of brain scan that's performed after a doctor has injected you with a drug a drug that uh, looks all over the body for amyloid plaques, and when it finds one, it sticks to it. All right, so you play a trick, and you uh, add a radioactive atom to that tracer. Okay, so you inject this radioactively labeled drug that sticks to, uh, to amyloid plaques, and then you get a PET scan, which is basically a radiation detector. So if you look at the bottom of the slide on the left, that's an example of what a brain looks like uh, where that drug stuck to a lot of amyloid plaques in the brain. In other words, there were a lot of plaques in the brain for this drug to stick to. So that's what a positive scan looks like. On the right is a, a patient who doesn't have any cognitive symptoms, and the scan was normal. Um, there are actually three of these uh, tracers that are now FDA approved. Um, the problem is that they're generally not paid for by insurance, and they're not paid for by Medicare. Um, at Stanford, the test costs about $7,000, cash please. Um, it's an expensive test. Um, many of us are working very hard to try to convince Medicare that, uh, that this test is worthwhile for certain patients. Um, one interesting fact is, now look at that scan on the left, that positive amyloid plaque, uh, uh, amyloid PET scan. 
in a room full of people who are aged sort of 65 and up, who are totally normal, completely cognitively normal, I give them detailed tests of their memory, they're fine, I ask their husbands and wives what their memory is like, and they say it's fine. How many of those people in that room actually have a scan that looks like the one on the left? People 65 and up. It's a lot of them, it's about a third. So about a third of completely healthy people have a rip-roaring positive scan. We don't know what that means yet. We're worried that this means that they're on their way to developing Alzheimer's disease, and actually the best available evidence now tells us that this scan becomes positive about 20 years uh, before a doctor diagnoses you with dementia. Okay, so I told you that a pathologist has to see both amyloid and tau in the brain in order to make a definite diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So the tests that I just told you about are tests for amyloid. Well, what about tests for tau? Well, uh, it turns out we have some of those too. Um, that same spinal fluid test that I told you about where a doctor can do a spinal tap and measure amyloid, well, you can also measure tau in the spinal fluid at the same time. It turns out that the finding there is that tau levels increase in Alzheimer's disease. And so in that same sample of spinal fluid, the doctor can find that you have low amyloid levels and high tau levels, and that's the pattern that's suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. And in addition, uh, there's a lot of activity in the field right now centered around tau imaging. Um, and it looks like tau imaging works, so it's, it's basically the same kind of scan that I showed you for an amyloid scan. You can also see if there are tau tangles in the brain. That technology looks like it works, and I suspect that we're going to see more and more tau imaging going on, uh, eventually uh, available in the clinic. There are other tests that are available that are a little bit less specific for Alzheimer's disease. A regular old MRI scan can't be used to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. That's important. But what you might see with an MRI is brain atrophy. Atrophy is shrinkage of the brain. And that might give a doctor a hint that there is a degenerative process going on, like Alzheimer's disease. But note that other illnesses can cause brain atrophy as well, not just Alzheimer's disease. And in addition, there's another older kind of PET scan that's available that can be called FDG PET. This is a more typical kind of PET scan. Um, and that can give doctors a hint of uh, brain activity and whether there's evidence of uh, a pattern of brain activity that's suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. But there again, it's not as specific as these other technologies I told you about. All right, so what if we learn from all these new biomarker tests that I just told you about? So as I hinted uh, already, amyloid is one of the first things to go wrong. In fact, we think that amyloid accumulates in the brain during a normal part of the aging process, such that by the time you transition to mild cognitive impairment, like the gentleman I just told you about at the beginning, amyloid is already pretty maximal in the brain. In other words, the brain is already pretty filled with amyloid plaques by the time somebody has very subtle symptoms. And there's not much difference between MCI and dementia in terms of how much amyloid there is in the brain. Tau's a little bit different. Tau probably accumulates in the brain a little bit later. And the best research available now suggests that most of that rise in amyloid occurs during the mild cognitive impairment stage or early, early dementia stage. And uh, cognitive decline is the last thing to happen. So there are a couple ways to interpret that. One is that, you know, aren't we as humans a remarkable species? Our brain can withstand an incredible amount of damage. It can, it can withstand all of these amyloid plaques and tau tangles before people start to exhibit symptoms. The flip side of this is by the time somebody shows up in my clinic, if I could somehow do an autopsy on them that day, I would see that their brain looks like a war zone. There's amyloid plaques all over the place. There's tau tangles all over the place. There's the detritus of dead uh, synapses and dead brain cells all over the place. Um, so this is a problem. We can't wait for patients to have cognitive symptoms before we start identifying them as having Alzheimer's disease and before we start treating them. And this is one of the greatest challenges uh, in our field. Just as an example of where I would use um, these kinds of biomarkers. So here's a patient who came to see me recently. Uh, 
Uh, Mrs. S, she's a, she's a young woman, 56, um, and she's had uh, three years of cognitive problems. Actually, her main problem is word finding. Um, and in fact, her vocabulary has now pretty much gone down to thing, area, him, her, it, that. She can't really think of specific nouns anymore, and it's hard for her to communicate as a result. So in somebody who's 56 years old and who has a language problem, I as a doctor am thinking that frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease are about 50-50 on my you know, likelihood of what's going on with her. And so using a biomarker test could actually be very helpful because it would, uh, you know, this is a patient in whom I would offer a spinal tap. And actually I would encourage her to undergo a spinal tap and to get her amyloid and tau levels checked because um, I would be able to tell her uh, if, if I think she has Alzheimer's disease versus frontotemporal dementia. And that's useful information for her and her family because it'll help me to uh, uh, educate them about what kinds of ex uh, symptoms to expect in the future and how this disease is likely to go. So that's an example of uh, how I use biomarkers practically in my clinic. How do we treat Alzheimer's disease? Well, not very well. There are four drugs that are FDA approved. Three of them are here. These three all do the same thing. You've probably heard of Aricept before. It's the most commonly prescribed medicine for Alzheimer's disease. These drugs boost the level of acetylcholine. It's a chemical in the brain. It makes people a little bit more alert, a little bit more focused, a little bit more in the moment, but it doesn't cure anything. It just squeezes a little bit more juice out of a brain that is going on to degenerate over time. There is, I told you there are four drugs that are FDA approved. The fourth one is called Memantine, um, and it kind of does the same thing. It, it squeezes a little bit more juice out of the brain but it doesn't cure anything. Here's one way to think about um, how drugs act. So if this is what happens to your intelligence over time, if you have Alzheimer's disease, in other words, an inexorable decline over time, here's what happens if you're given one of the currently FDA approved drugs, which I'll call a symptomatic treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So at any given level or any given point in time, these drugs can boost your intelligence a little bit, but do you see how I drew, drew this curve such that the slope is the same? In other words, how fast it's declining over time? So that's what I mean by a symptomatic treatment. These drugs are not able to change the trajectory over time. They don't prevent people from getting worse, and in fact, they get worse at about the same rate if they had never been on drug. What we really need, and what we're working very hard to develop, are disease-modifying drugs, drugs that actually change the course of the underlying disease itself and stop it from getting worse, okay? And this is what we hope a curve will look like, that your intelligence can, can uh, flatten off and stop declining over time if you're given one of these uh, disease-modifying drugs. If you don't believe me, believe the drug company. Um, so uh, this is data from the manufacturer of Dinepazil, uh, Aricept. Uh, proving to you that in fact it doesn't change anything about the underlying disease. Uh, so here I am going to use a pointer, but I think, yes, I can use the computer to do it so you can see it on both screens. All right, so patients were given placebo or uh, Aricept. There is a placebo effect, so patients with placebo and with the active drug both got better on their intelligence after six weeks. But then you see the placebo people started dropping off and they started getting worse over time. And look, the patients on Aricept did great. You know, their intelligence sort of, you know, stayed high over this brief 24-week trial. But then they played a trick and everybody who was on placebo stayed on placebo. Everybody who had been on the active drug were now switched to placebo. And look at what happened. So, uh, the patients who were on the drug now drop down to the point where, they, uh, where, the, where the placebo patients were, such that they were no better off in the long run for having been on that medicine. Okay? So that's the proof that the medicines that are currently available aren't really fixing anything. Okay, I lied to you. We actually do have a disease-modifying therapy. It's called exercise. Um, there's been copious amounts of evidence that people who engage in regular aerobic exercise 
If today you're demented and you start engaging in that exercise, you can slow the rate of progression. You can, you know, you can't stop the disease from getting worse, but you can at least slow it down. If today you do not have dementia and you start a regular aerobic exercise program, you can reduce your chances of ever getting dementia. Or if you get it, you can delay the age uh, at onset. So exercise is one of the most biologically potent things that we know of for uh, interfering in the dementia process. And a sedentary lifestyle is a risk factor for dementia and for more rapid decline. Mental stimulation is important. Doing things like coming to an educational conference like this one, you're, you're forming new synapses right now as I speak, um, and you're doing good things for your brain and you're helping to prevent uh, yourself from ever going on to get Alzheimer's disease. Cognitive stimulation is all the things that make up a busy, active lifestyle from social interactions to hobbies to having projects if you still have a job, uh, adventure, going on trips, going to museums. Um, I often get asked about brain training software. There's nothing special about the computer games that some companies sell. If you like them, that's great. If you would rather be out socializing you know, talking with friends about current events, that's equally good for you. There's nothing special about a computer game that's any better than all of the other cognitively stimulating things that you can do in your life. I get a lot of questions about vitamins, herbs, and other supplements. Some are absolutely known to be ineffective. Ginkgo biloba, for instance, has been subjected to several large randomized placebo-controlled modern clinical trials where you give patients placebo and ginkgo biloba, and guess what happens over time? You absolutely can't tell the difference between the two groups. Ginkgo biloba does nothing, so, so that we know. Some might be harmful. There's been mixed evidence about vitamin E over the years. Um, ten years ago, we thought that vitamin E was, you know, the savior of mankind. You know, doctors were prescribing it willy-nilly, telling patients that it was going to prevent cancer and prevent heart disease. And so, in fact, some people sat down and did some big clinical trials to try to prove it. And do you know what they found? Patients on vitamin E got more strokes and heart failure. Not much. These, these were huge clinical trials with thousands of patients, and it was just a few extra patients in the vitamin E group that, that uh, suffered from side effects. But it was enough to make it statistically significant, and it was clear that there was no overwhelming positive effect. Um, Hormone replacement therapy is another example of something that is risky business in an older woman. Um, for most vitamins and supplements that are out there, uh, we just don't know because we haven't, nobody's ever done a, a, a modern placebo controlled randomized clinical trial and we just don't know if they're helpful. Um, and I encourage people to be skeptical consumers. Don't believe every YouTube video you see on the internet about some miracle cure for Alzheimer's disease because chances are somebody's just trying to sell you their snake oil um, and, it's, and it's not really going to be helpful. What about new therapies? So this is the part that I think is really exciting. Now that we have all these biomarker tests available and now that we know, for instance, that uh, amyloid deposition is one of the first things to go wrong, doesn't it make sense to develop drugs that attack amyloid in the brain? Well, in fact, that does make sense, and there's been uh, an incredible amount of work on this over the past 20 years. Um, immunotherapy is one way to attack amyloid, so this is using your body's own immune system, your own defense system, except that we retrain your immune system to think that amyloid is a foreign substance and that it needs to go away, just like that flu virus. There are two ways to do this. One way is to give people a vaccine, right? So you can vaccinate people against amyloid beta. The immune system now recognizes amyloid as being a foreign substance and it searches all over the body for it and tries to attack it. Another way is to uh, manufacture antibodies and uh, give those antibodies to people. Antibodies are proteins that sort of uh, bind to and flag amyloid as being foreign and then the immune system goes in and cleans it up. So they're conceptually pretty similar. So what have we found? Well, there have been mixed results. The first vaccine trial started in 2000 and it had to be halted because 6% of patients who were vaccinated against beta amyloid developed meningitis. In other words, they developed a, a, a strong inflammatory reaction in their brain 
they probably didn't get an infectious meningitis. Probably it was the case that their immune system just found so much amyloid in the brain to attack that it went a little bit wild. Okay. So that approach didn't work well, and that's actually why uh, there's been so much attention in manufacturing antibodies that you can deliver intravenously to people, because that's another safer way of using the immune system to attack amyloid. And the first generation, we, the, you know, the first generation of these antibodies have made it all the way and completed phase three clinical trials, and those trials have been have been negative for the most part. Um, what went wrong? were worried, was the wrong dose chosen? Were the wrong patients chosen? So the patients who were chosen for those clinical trials were patients who already had full-fledged dementia. Okay, maybe it was too late. Maybe we need to be delivering these drugs to people at an earlier stage of the disease. Um, other people argue that amyloid is the wrong target. Um, our field has uh, Baptists, people who think the beta amyloid protein, get it, Baptists, uh, who think the beta amyloid protein is the most important uh, target in Alzheimer's disease, and the Taoists, who have been arguing that, you know, <laughs> you guys have had it wrong for all these years, you need to be going after Tao. So right now, the Taoists are having a heyday, because uh, they're saying, look, you're, there's this string of failed clinical trials of drugs against beta amyloid, you guys have it wrong. So this battle is still actively being played out, um, and drug companies are working hard to develop new drugs against, against Tau, and also to answer some of these other questions with uh, existing amyloid treatments. Um, you may have heard uh, just a, a few days ago in uh, Nice, France, there was a big international conference on Alzheimer's disease, and some exciting new uh, results were announced by a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Biogen IDEC. Um, they actually had a positive result in a, in a phase one trial of an anti-amyloid antibody. They were able to uh, uh, radically slow the decline in uh, people's cognition over a fairly short period of time. This came at the expense of a, a pretty notable side effect. Patients get uh, brain edema, brain swelling, um, kind of akin to that meningitis that I told you about that happened in the vaccine trial. Um, so, it's exciting. This is the first time that a company has showed that an anti-amyloid therapy is really able to alter the, uh, the, the, the course of patients with Alzheimer's disease. We need to weigh as a field, what can we do about that side effect? Can we make it go away? Is it really not that big of a deal? Um, so this is something that we're uh, actively struggling with. It is clear that early intervention is important. Clinical trials are increasingly going to be uh, leaning on patients with mild cognitive impairment or even normal patients who are at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Remember I told you that a third of healthy older adults have a positive amyloid brain scan? Well, there's a trial going on right now of those people. So you can enroll in a clinical trial by going, you're perfectly healthy, you go in and you get one of these brain scans and find out that you have amyloid in your brain and you can start on one of these therapies. And this trial is going to take a long time because, see, you have to wait and see who goes on to get dementia and who doesn't and see, you know, see whether the drug has, has really worked. Um, so we have great hope that early intervention is going to be uh, helpful and we're going to be using biomarkers and also using genetics to help us to identify people who are at risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. In addition, as I hinted, there are, uh, we're going to be seeing more and more clinical trials attacking uh, tau uh, and, uh, and other targets in Alzheimer's disease. Um, my vision of the future is that Alzheimer's disease will probably be a lot like HIV. You know, in HIV, you don't go on one drug. You go on several drugs that attack the virus at once. And, uh, and that's been a big success in HIV. I think in Alzheimer's disease, in the future, we're probably going to need multiple drugs to attack the disease from multiple angles in order to really give the most benefit to patients. And so one day, um, hopefully this gentleman who I told you about at the beginning, the 68-year-old man who couldn't remember that his wife had just told him that his niece was getting married, He'll come into my clinic, we'll do an amyloid PET scan, and I'll find out that it's rip-roaring positive. He's got amyloid plaques all over his brain. 
We'll do a tau PET scan and we'll find out that it's intermediate positive, suggesting that he is starting to accumulate tau in his brain and this is really worrisome. I will get him started on anti-amyloid and anti-tau therapy and I will stop the progression of his disease. This is my vision of the future. Um, we're not quite there yet. Um, we need a lot more money for research. We need a lot more people who are interested in participating in clinical trials. This is very hard work. It's expensive work and it's long work. Um, but I think that this is a puzzle that we can solve. Um, and I hope that all of you will help us uh, in this journey. So just wanted to uh, thank all of you. Um, I just put up some notes about uh, uh, where I come from and where I do my clinical work at Stanford. But I also want to put in a big plug for the Alzheimer's Association, which is uh, really an incredible leader, uh, both in advancing the care and support of patients with Alzheimer's disease, uh, but also in supporting uh, research. They are the biggest private funders of uh, research, and they're really trying to pick up the slack, and the government has left a lot of slack in this area. Um, so I just want to highlight their important contributions. So thanks very much.